difference between the case where um, p squared is bigger than 4m squared and p squared is less than 4m squared. Of course, kinematically, we can see that now the scalar can decay to two fermions. And indeed, that is at the root of the thing that we observed last time, which is that the self-energy now has an imaginary piece okay? that was not there when we were below the threshold for scalar decay to fermions. And that imaginary piece, indeed, we're about to see, is related, directly related to the fact that this thing can now kinematically decay. Okay? So, um, so let's write our address propagator. This is the dress propagator in some normalized version of it. And um, let me Let's look. between this M physical and M renormalized uh, when it's already inside here, of course, is um, a bit silly. But so I could just put M squared renormalized to this accuracy that I'm working in on one loop. But all I'm doing is taking the general expression for the dress propagator and going nearly on shell sense. Just breaking it up into real and imaginary. Now, since there is a finite imaginary part, it's pretty silly for me to write the plus i epsilon because this is finite, this is infinitesimal, so I will no longer write that i epsilon there. And, um, you can see why I couldn't say M physical. Because there is no M physical, you cannot make the denominator vanish for a real value of P squared, for 
real momentum, uh, this would not vanish, okay, because there's an imaginary piece. Uh, so instead, I'm putting the quotes to say, if it were only not for the imaginary part, if the imaginary part could be neglected, then this would, would have been a sort of one loop, good approximation. <coughs> um, this would have been a good approximation to the physical, the position of the physical pole, but I'm putting quotes because there is this imaginary part, so this truly does not vanish. Okay. Um, and uh, the again, whether I choose to evaluate this imaginary part at m squared normalized or m squared physical doesn't matter at the order that I'm working with. Okay. So what we're doing is we're so what we're really doing is we're just zooming in. On, we're thinking of this as small, and it is small because it's only there at one loop. Okay, and we're looking at where we would normally have expected a pole. Okay, and then saying, well, it's not really a, it's a it's a pole in the complex plane, but it's not a it's not a pole for real momentum. And, but this is just a small effect. Okay, so it's almost like the i epsilon has thickened out from infinitesimal to some small size. Okay. Um, in fact, we can write it as a, just to emphasize that, let me write it as a plus i and a minus uh, the imaginary part like this. If you remember last time, the, the imaginary part turned out to be negative, and I was saying that's important. So you see, minus the imaginary part really is like kind of a plus epsilon. Okay. And uh, so let's look at this for, uh, so let's choose the case where the, where the P0 is positive. study that case. The other one is straightforward again. Um, in that case, this thing looks like I, so we can factorize this into a positive pole and a negative pole. And so we get P0 minus omega physical. I'll put the quotes by which I just mean use that to get the
second factor. So again, you sort of separate this into a P, a P0 minus omega term and a P0 plus omega term. P0 plus omega term, well, P0 in this vicinity, P0 is equal to omega, if I'm, in that, if I'm approximating this. So a good approximation is that this is just 2 omega, and then you have the other sign of the I epsilon. Okay. Um, so for now, this is actually a minus, and this is a negative imaginary term. Okay. Um, what does this mean then? So let's consider, so this gives the far future asymptotic upon Fourier transformation. Okay, and uh, so we get integral dp0 e to the minus i t and then so I'm, I'm, I'm just keeping the p0 dependence this is just some constant I'm going to throw it away I mean it's just some I'm just trying to study what is the time dependence. The time dependence comes from Fourier transform with respect to P0. That's what I'm doing here. And so I get uh, P0 minus omega physical and uh, plus I over two omega physical minus the imaginary part of sigma. Okay. So this is exactly, I mean, you evaluate this exactly the same way you do when it's an I epsilon. You say, oh, there's a pole at omega physical but sitting a little below the axis because of this term, okay? And uh, you do the usual contour integral depending on whether uh, time is positive or negative. So we have positive time. Um, and so you get this is equal to one plus the option of the i and the two pi of this step function of time. So I am looking in the far future really. Um, e to the minus i. So the only difference with the standard calculation here, the representation of the step function using this language, the only difference is that in getting the step function by doing that contour integral, that you've got e to the i p zero t, and the p zero has to be evaluated using the contour integral method, using the residue. It has to be evaluated at the actual position of the complex pole. So you actually have to go to P0, which equals this complex number. And that has to get stuck in there. And so that's what I'm doing. Okay. So it's important that we are, we're not doing anything crazy in the sense of thinking that momentum, this momentum P might have come. You know, this momentum P might have come from some other particles, may not even be the same particles as in this loop, but they've injected some momentum P1 
plus P2, and P1 plus P2 is equal to P. So ultimately, this P, even if it's off shell, or not quite on shell, or whatever, okay, it ultimately derives from external lines, which is to say physical momenta in the real world, the technically real number world. And so P0, of course, is a real, is real. And indeed, I'm only going doing a Fourier transform by integrating real numbers. But when I, the method of, by using the computer integral method, we're just being told as an intermediate math step that we should plug in P0 equal to this complex number. Okay. Um, but that is just a quick way of getting the the answer thought of this way, which is just doing a purely real integral. It just happens to equal something where you think of P0 as suddenly moving off in the complex plane. Okay. But physically it's not. Okay, so this is the guy we are after. Because now we can see that the that, that if we look at um, some system where the dress propagator shows up, where you have some sources or guns and detectors, and you're studying the signal that you send, that um, the, the amplitude would look like this. And the probability, the probability particle goes This is equal to, um, or at least it's proportional to, because I dropped various factors. But the time dependence is given by just squaring this amplitude, the absolute value squared. Um, but here, the minus, the, the i's are going to cancel out. And so I get e to the minus, this minus imaginary part of sigma tilde over now just omega physical. Two goes away by squaring the amplitude. And then, uh, and then time. Okay. Since this is actually positive, we have a decaying exponential. So what this is saying is, for some reason, this particle is not making it from here to there. And, and of course, that can only happen because it somehow decayed. Something it was destroyed on route from here to here. Otherwise, in fact, the probability would have had to be time independent. Okay. So this is the. So this is a therefore a survival.
minus just takes into account then that this was actually a negative number. So this is actually a positive decay rate. Uh, it's a good thing that it was positive. It would make very little sense if you had a negative decay rate. Um, the fact that we are sort of plugging in, we're evaluating at a momentum, which would have been the sort of physical mass, but for this effect itself that the particle decays is is called the narrow is is the narrow width approximation. Approximation because we calculated this with in perturbation theory. But in general, and so it's a kind of a leading approximation where I'm neglecting the fact when I when I'm working out where where to even approximate my p squared, like what p squared I should consider, that I'm zooming in on what would have been the physical mass but for this. Um, So there are corrections to this from, if you're going to say you're doing a higher loop calculation, I don't want to do it, but if you're doing a higher loop computation or you have some non-perturbative process, then this thing could be big enough that you cannot sort of say, well, let me just zoom in pretending it wasn't there on this. That tells me which p squared I'm interested in, and that's the p squared I'm going to stuff in here. Okay? That that, that is a kind of iterative approximation, which is a narrow width approximation. But it's not always true. Okay. I mean, it's not always true when you go beyond one loop. And um, if you really want the full answer, you just want to know what, what does, um, you can use the full, you know, this is, this is always correct, whatever this says. And if you, for your transform it, That'll give you some time dependence, and the time dependence will tell you the rate of decay. So if you want the absolute truth, that's it. This is an approximation. Um, notice that it has, note this just um, realizes time dilation. Appears that the rate drops if the particle has momentum. Okay, the higher the momentum, the more it drops. That's exactly what you expect from Lorentz time dilation, whoever's time dilation that is. Uh, very good. So now there is a very interesting result. You see, so we kind of got this. You know, there are two ways of calculating this decay rate. What we actually calculated was not the decay rate. If you look literally at the process that we've drawn, just look at it there, this was actually a survival calculation. It was asking, what is the amplitude to survive? That's what this really was, the amplitude to survive from source to detector. Um, of course, 1 minus the survival rate is the decay rate. So not surprisingly, we are able to get a formula for a decay rate. But you might have thought there's another way to do it. If you want to look at the decay of the particle, why didn't you just consider the particle decay? Why didn't we consider this other, you know, this, why didn't we consider this diagram? Why not just do that diagram? So let's do that. And it is in some sense not immediately obvious from these Feynman diagrams that calculating a rate in this way should match up with calculating this way. But of course, it must be there's only one rate. So let's see how that works. And that will be a, a verification of the optical theorem in the context of quantum field theory. Or another way to say it is, 
unitarity of the S matrix. And so we'll let's just first check it out and then we'll go to the general formulation of that. Okay. So let's again study this deep connection between the survival rate and the decay rate, which is trivial if I say it like that, but at the level of diagrams. Um, let's start again with our self-energy. But what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to massage it in the right variables. I'm going to massage it in the right variables to show very explicitly how it connects to this. Okay. So here it is again. This is the minus one for Fermi statistics. Here's the vertex of the interaction. And um, so I'm detail again. This is the fermion propagator in position space. And here is the fermion propagator in the so, so all I'm doing is this diagram, where this is 0, this is x. Of course, in general, it's x and y, but by translation, it varies 0 and x. And I'm doing the integral over x. And so I'm just calculating the sigma um, of p squared. I'm calculating it by working directly, by taking, by, by, by working in position space final rules, and then Fourier transforming to sigma. Okay, so this is a perfectly sane way to do it. It's naively not very efficient because we don't, we'd rather work in momentum space right from the start for this thing. It's more efficient, but this is a more insightful way. Um, okay, now here, Indeed, I am going to Fourier transform. But I'm going to only Fourier transform in this expression space, but not time. Because time is playing the leading role in this whole story, like decay rate, as in decay rate. So, so I want to keep time as much as possible the, the way it is intuitively clear. Ordinary time rather than energy space. But momentum, I don't care about. Spatial momentum. Let's take advantage of translation invariance and just do it the usual way. So I'm going to write um, this as integral just over spatial momentum, over t, uvi, t0, and uh, the trace of. So everybody knows that the fermion propagator is the Dirac operator acting on the scalar propagator. Okay, so let me just write that back down. Um, so here, This is the Dirac operator in real time and spatial momentum space. Okay, but um, but now it has to act on the scalar propagator in the same space, which we know is step function in time, uh, e to the minus i omega. That's the u divided by 2 omega. So this is the usual scalar propagator. So this thing is just writing out who this guy is after I Fourier transform the spatial x. And then, uh, but then I have this other propagator. So let me write that down. So I have to multiply by 
minus i dt gamma 0. Um, it's minus because one of these propagators is like this and one like this. Okay. In other words, if I go from psi to psi bar, then it's psi to psi bar like this. And then um, minus q minus p. So Have I consistently used capital omega for the fermion before, or have I just been no, flip-flopping? You haven't used capital omega. I think I know. I at one lecture I did use the word. I said let's use this for the thing which is associated with that, and this with that. But um, you prefer uh, just keep it like this. So you know who this is. That's that's all I care about. Um, minus t, and then e to the i omega t minus p uh, t. And I'm just short circuiting a step, which would have been there would have been an integral d cubed spatial x, and you would have had a momentum spatial momentum for this factor and a spatial momentum for this factor, and when you did the two, you'd find that the spatial momentum here has to be this guy minus p, or p minus this guy. Okay. So, but, uh, so I hope you can just see that from familiarity with doing Fourier transforms. The product of the spatial dependence is given by the convolution in uh, in Q space. Okay, that's what you're used to. And the trace is over everything. To the and right the trace is over everything. Okay. Right, just as usual. Yeah. So it's a bit of a mess. Um, sorry, are you just seeing one over two omega factor? Yes. The second? Absolutely. Q minus P, P minus Q, it's in the energy, it doesn't matter. And then, um, I don't know, but you, do you have any minus sign mistake in the second part for the Dirac operator, for the momentum in the vector part? Or you flip P minus Q to rewrite so, as P minus Q? So let's see, this is Q, Maybe we can see. and this is P minus Q going this way, oh. but and then you flip Since I, is that a rhetorical question and you know the answer and you're gonna tell no, me? No, no, no. I checked last year, but yeah, I think that's for, yeah, let's check. Um, of course, if, it does, if things don't work out, then you'll know. Because I found some minus sign. <laughs> yeah, I remember last year, yeah, yeah. it came up. Um, I'm trying to remember if it was this year. So let's, let's be robotic for a second. The G of minus X. And this, so you have to flip all the t-dependent. There's that. Um, this one, it it looks wrong to me. It looks yeah. like it should have been p minus q. Yeah, so. um, but anyway, we can handle minus sign. Say again. We can handle minus sign. We can. Right? Ha yes, you can handle minus signs. <laughs> yeah. Um, Um, okay, this is obviously very messy, but as I said, this is the most insightful way of doing it by just staying in real time and using spatial momentum as much as possible. So let's gather everything together and things collapse handily. Why? Because even though there are four terms here, this has to multiply this, and this has to multiply this. Otherwise, these cross terms have to vanish. Okay, so let's just take advantage of that, and then we just get e to the i p zero t trace 
of um, uh, what's going to happen. Let's see. Uh, with this DDT, so let's, so let's look at the term that looks like this. Okay. The uh, and, um, <coughs> the DDT can hit this, in which case it just turns into the appropriate on-shell Q0, okay? And, and, and similarly this, this guy. But it could also have hit the step function. And um, let me just see. But you see that when it hits the step function, the two step functions give opposite sign delta functions. They cancel. Okay. So, right, so this is clear. This hits the step function, or it hits this step function, they, the two just cancel. So I can drop that and just make the DDT hit the phase factor. In which case, you see that you get a very simple expression, which looks like this. P bar slash plus M. Um, this just becomes the on-shell omega, then the whole thing is just the on-shell Dirac operator, which is just what I'm writing here. Okay. Remember the bar just means the zeroth component is determined by the spatial components. Okay. Um, and then I, have to ha then, I, then I have to keep these pieces, and that's step function time e to the minus i omega q plus omega q minus p t and then plus step function of time uh, e to the i q plus over easier to stare at. Um, now, there are some standard spinner identities for these objects. I just remind you that um, So I'm going to write minus this. So when I write it as minus, then there's a minus n. That is equal to sum over
So therefore, we can evaluate this trace as p bar slash plus m. So we, so we basically, this is a matrix, and this is another matrix, and I'm supposed to multiply them and trace it. But tracing, you see, will make this U bar hit this V, and this V bar hit this U. So I'll end up with um, sum over S and S prime, U bar. So you end up, when you take the trace, you end up with two inner products. That inner product and then the spinner indices hook up between these two. But that's just the square of the same thing. Okay. So, so that's why it looks like this. Why did you switch the orders of P and Q? Um, so let me just say, suppose, suppose um, So if I take, so in, in this thing, Q0 is, so suppose I take this term and the Q, oh sorry, if I take, yeah, if I take the step function positive in time and I take the Q0 to be positive because it comes from this term, okay? Then this is this is th this expression is only true when this is on shell and sensibly positive energy. So this these these identities that you know and love are always for positive energy for momentum. So if I'm studying this term, this guy, then I'm it must have come from the Q0 hitting that guy which means that this guy has positive energy. But that means that um, Okay, I'll check the algebra right here, but let me tell let me answer your question morally and then the algebra yeah. better follow suit. <laughs> Which is that in this thing, we're looking at, so, so basically you can see what's happening under our eyes is that we're getting expressions where everything is on shell in some way, okay? But if one of these is on shell in the sense that Q bar zero is positive, okay, we're looking at an expression like that, then, and the other guy, so this is, that guy positive, then we're looking to see that there's another term where this is P0 uh, minus Q0 bar uh, positive as well. Okay? There's a certain amount of positive, so we're, we're doing P squared greater than zero, and um, So 
I'm putting in the P. Suppose I'm putting in P0 positive here. And if I'm putting in P0 positive, then I can, I can actually have a positive Q0 bar and a positive P0 minus Q0 bar. Even though this is positive and I'm subtracting it, there are, I can have both of these being positive. Now, you can say, but couldn't I have other things? I think that's the only question you could have. Is there, is there some other option So I'm trying to collapse it down to things which all look like this. Now let me see if, we, if I did it right. Um, just focusing on the first term. The Q0 is definitely positive. That's good. I'm not sure, but in the second term, yeah. for the vector part, I think it must be plus bracket times gamma vector, so that you will get minus of 2 minus p. Then you can you, recover. Uh, wait, are you, there were many sign flips in that state. You were just so, saying I got a sign mistake in, so, in that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I'm but not that. sure, but in the second term. Yeah, I suspect term, I have a sign mistake, but yeah. I need to just So minus it. I got delta gamma 0 plus p minus q vector, because we are looking for minus p dot x, so that overall minus sign should be there. So you're saying that, and then the argument you, is, it's, I'm going from, I'm doing this, yeah. um, so if I were going from here to here, and I see the arrow of q, I just go minus that. So always we have to have a relative minus sign between time and space directions. And then if, if you look yeah, at the second that's okay. So I'm okay with, I'm, I'm okay with this. So I'm just trying to follow the same rule that I use here. Right. I'm going from here to here and I put a minus Q. Yep. Now I'm going from here to here. Right. So I should put a, shouldn't I put a minus T minus Q? There would be this e to the i p dot x, which would be e to the minus i p dot x, like that. And, and so the step that I missed in getting to here would be, um, and I have to, of course, sum over all the q's and p's. So I'd have to go p q k and, and, and p q p q. And if I do this, I would just get delta function of uh, k minus q minus p. And so this I do not want. Should that be a minus? Go back 
to spatial Here when it was here when it was plus i grad dot gamma, the i grad pulls down that is minus. Okay. Um, so if you're starting from plus i e x. Yeah. Convention for the Fourier transform. Yeah. Yeah. To get a G of x, you have to use minus i q x convention inverse Fourier transform. Oh. So that you have okay. to have plus i q dot x vector. So and then okay. So you're saying I could have stuck to yeah. my original right, yeah. convention like this. And then the first one must be plus. This was a plus. This is a minus. So, yeah. And then I would just say okay, I was just yeah. doing that's right. I grad. Yeah. I grad is what I did here. Right. And that goes with the IBT. Here it's minus minus I grad. Uh -huh. The minus I grad hits um, down minus i grad pull down a minus k so let's see it's a plus and then also plus i think plus i q x plus i k x minus i q x uh, so k so k yeah equals this works right so k is equal to p minus q p minus q so yeah so that works yes okay and then the um that must be minus so this plus. Is, yeah, that must be plus then. So our both sign must be plus. So it's plus I grab K minus I grad hits plus I K. Minus I grad hits plus I K and gives me K. Yes. So and K is P minus P minus. So both sign is plus Q. Plus K. And then you get everything I can break it. So it's just the convolution formula, but the sign mattered. <laughs> And that so, equal so the equally minus IPX is actually the IPX. Yes. Right. So back to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so your spin sum identity is is that correct as written, or do you just want those two switched on the left side? Um. You said. Yeah. Hang on. So let me <laughs> let me come back to here. And uh, so this is a positive energy Q slash plus M, uh -huh. for which this is the identity. And then there is a One side, p minus q minus m there, and then you use the identity. Oh. 
look, this thing is picking out, oh, this is picking out a minus right. p uh, 0 minus q 0 yeah. r. And then you okay. want to take off gamma 0. OK, so there's an overall minus sign, and then I have, but I just want this part of the expression. Yeah. The hard question is simply this. Let's make sure in the above line, just write the above line, you, you have p minus q minus n in the integral expression. Yeah, right here. Gotcha. Yes. And then everything. Whew, okay. Um, but did I answer your question just regarding why I'm writing this then? This is. Yeah, we'll soon. When you switch it on the right hand side, that means we had to have switched it on the left hand side, and so we just tracked that down, right? <laughs> I was just, you switch. Right hand side of here? Yeah, you just switch those to P minus Q. Oh, so, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, so that's yes. because it was over there. Yeah. Okay. It's because and I'm it thinking. It comes from a minus sign yeah. or several. We're trying to see something that looks like this amplitude lurking somewhere here. And indeed, it is there. And so. So here is the magic result, then. The imaginary part of sigma, this thing that we are trying to um, By the way, there's sigma, there's sigma renormalized, or things with various things removed from sigma. It doesn't matter, actually, when I'm taking the imaginary part here, because if you remember those integration constants, A and B, they're just real. So, so this is. Imaginary part of either sigma or sigma or normalized. But basically, let's do it. You can just take g squared integral dq q integral dt e to the i t to the p. And now, um, I forget I forgot the step functions, right? So goes back. And um, oh no, sorry. So in taking this, notice that if you just take the imaginary part of uh, look, all of this stuff, all of this stuff is just real. It's an absolute magnitude squared of something. That's what that result says. Um, in taking the imaginary part, there are just these phase factors. But then the complex conjugate of these phase factors is sitting over here. 